What is your name and where are you calling from? Hello, this is Jen LaPietro from Florida. Well, hello, Jen from Florida. Welcome to Texas. What is the question for your rabbi today? Okay, uh, this has to do with Judges 11, 29 through 38. Uh, this is the story of um, Japheth, Japheth, Japheth. And the thing that bothers me, there's a, uh, it's, I'm not sure what the, the lesson is, but it seems like a horrible abomination story. But it seems like either you're supposed to keep your promises mm. or you're not supposed to bargain with God. Or why would a daughter allow herself to be sacrificed? You know, be oh. gone for two months. I mean, I would run and never come back. <laughs> that sounds like something I would do or, well, not that I'm a girl. but hey, you know, So I'd like to know what good, is the good, lesson good of the story or the deep meaning or... Can this story be salvaged somehow to have a deep meaning? Wonderful. Oh, this is a um, thank you very much. For your thank you, Jen. And, and just listen in for your answer, okay? Thank you so much. Okay, I'll, thank you. Okay, bye bye. Bye bye. Yeah, this is um, you know one of the things. One of the things that, if you read the Bible carefully, it's very striking. Whoa, let me just do one thing. Uh, I know it's irregular, but I forgot to turn on the camera. Okay. One of the things that you'll find when studying scripture is that there are many years, in fact, decades, that are missing in, in Tanakh, in the Hebrew Bible. Uh, they're actually just, they're not there. And scripture will pass over large segments of time uh, to get to a certain event that occurred. So it's very clear that the Bible is not to be understood as a history book, although it contains history, because it's clearly not interested in conveying what happened in the past, but rather providing an, 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 a, a very a, a vital message to teach us how to guide our lives. And in almost all cases, when scripture passes over enormous swaths of time and stops and gives us this, um, this, this the, of, an, of, uh, describes an event that occurred, it's usually a disaster. It's usually a problem, a very serious problem. You know that when young men and women go to medical school, what are they studying? Usually disease. They have to be able to identify uh, what can cause pain, what can cause injury, what causes illness. There's something, a lot of disease. And in fact, that's what we find in Scripture. The event here, the Bible stops and zooms in on the event that occurred to Yiftach. Yiftach was an, uh, an, an, a, an extraordinary uh, military man. He was like the Arnold Schwarzkopf. But there was a lot of division in his family. But ultimately, the Jewish people were going to battle with their enemies, and he was the Moshe Dayan of his time. He was the great Israeli general, and he was uh, called in to lead the battle because although he was not personally liked by even those close to him, even his own family, it was widely understood that he was a person who had enormous military genius, very much like the Moshe Dayan and Ariel Sharon and so on, whose personal lives may have been a disaster, but their military career was very striking. And it's the kind of person, so that gives you an idea, it's these kinds of generals who, if you're on the battlefield, uh, these are the kind of people you want leading you. These are the people you want guiding you. But in their personal lives, they're a, a train wreck. Now, what occurs is when Yiftach uh, comes back from battle, and he is very, very successful, he is gloating over the achievement that he had with Israel's enemies, and he makes a vow. A, 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 the vow was that the, when I come to my home, the first thing that comes out of my home, and just so you understand, unlike Miami, where you just have your house, home meant your ranch. You know, wherever, you know the first thing that comes out of my house, I'm going to offer as a sacrifice. It was a, it was a fairly 
a mindless act. And as I said, uh, you know, although uh, Ariel Sharon was the first uh, Israeli general to, to refer to Israel's presence in Judean Samaria as an occupation, I'm not kidding, but he was a, a genius on the battlefield. And he was, God did use him um, to, to win great military victories for the state of Israel. Well, what happens is uh, he comes, he makes this vow, and who comes out to greet him? His own daughter, okay? Now, this vow would have been rendered, would have been absolutely meaningless. Like, what would have happened if a dog came out of his house, a horse came out of his house? These are unclean animals, obviously unsuitable for sacrifice. What happens is then is a convergence of absolute disasters. At the time, the high priest, at the time, the judges of that period, meaning the leaders, the spiritual leaders of that time, when they discovered this, they should have said to him, your vow is null and void, it's meaningless, it's a, it's a ridiculous vow, it therefore has no value, you can't, obviously you're not going to bring a, a person as a sacrifice, uh, but they felt that mm, he should have perhaps approached them, so their pride was was inflated. He was too proud to ask. Uh, what happens here is, is that the daughter, she's the only innocent person in, the, in this whole event. She willingly is going to be a sacrifice. Now, technically, he doesn't actually uh, sacrifice her. If you look very carefully at the text, you need to do that. The daughter asks for time to celebrate her virginity with her, uh, her friends. Uh, she is someone who, she was a young woman who had never been with a man, and she was prepared to live in complete object isolation, meaning not that literally she was killed, but she was now going to live the rest of her life, never marry, never have children, in complete isolation. And she asked for her father for a little time. The, 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 the events that were encountering in the book of Judges in particular is what happens when you have really bad leadership at every, in, from every angle. So you have a military uh, giant who knows little about Jewish law, who when he comes home acts recklessly, uh, but he wasn't a, a scholar, he wasn't a priest, he wasn't a uh, a man who sat on the Sanhedrin. And what happens when you have corrupt leadership? that would not step forward to intervene and say to him, this vow is meaningless, you can't make a vow like that. Your vow is null and void. They could have done that as well. So you have a, a convergence of horrendous leadership on every level, which leads to an innocent young girl living out the rest of her life in isolation. So are and you saying that in the, the text doesn't say that he killed her, that it was, it was... Right, that what happened, it was like he killed her because she eventually would die childless. One other point wow. should be made about the Book of Judges in general, and that is that the Book of Judges is essentially a, also a setup why we would need kings because as the end of the book of judges comes to uh when it closes there is its epic passage where it says basically every person was just doing what was right in their eyes if people are don't are not familiar with this uh bear in mind that prior to king saul we lived in the period of the judges and the judges meant that the, the each tribe had its own leadership, obviously its own land, and there was a, a sort of a loose confederacy, but there wasn't a single person to unify the people. There were prophets who were certainly influential, but you did not have a human king. You didn't have a, the Davidic kingdom did not begin yet. Uh, so therefore this loose confederacy of states essentially led to problems, disaster after disaster. Uh, the prophet um, Shmuel, Samuel, is reluctant to have a king who would be a, a leader of the people of Israel, a spiritual and physical leader who would unify the people. It, he was obviously reluctant because he was so devout that to him the idea that, that the Jewish people would have a human king was to him 
um, difficult. Like we have one king, and that's God. Mm-hmm. So that's a little bit of a struggle in when w- Israel has to make that uh, transition. But recognize this: that whenever Israel makes a transition for the good, it usually follows enormous trauma. Re- remember that. Mm-hmm. Um, in fact, when finally the Jewish people are forced to uh, choose a king, it happens after a horrific civil war with the tribe of Benjamin, where Benjamin, the tribe is nearly wiped out completely. They almost, almost every member of that tribe, almost, was killed. So in general, if you look at Jewish history, and that's what we're, we're encountering here, what happens is you have disastrous leadership. So we can we could take this event in the Book of Judges, very, very famous, and we can extrapolate it to the summer of 2005, where you have pressure coming from the White House to evacuate the a part of the land of Israel, the southwestern part of the land of Israel, which is part of the um, tribe of Judah, and it's called Gush Katif, 21 Jewish communities in area, called the Gaza Strip. And you know what? Yeah, there were some Jewish leaders that condemned it, but a lot of Jewish leaders just said, oh, I don't know, maybe, yeah, maybe no. You know, I don't want to name names because a lot of them are alive, but we all know what happened. Mm -hmm. That means what should have happened in 2005 was that all the sages of Israel should have stood up and said this is a crime, this is a disaster, and you do not give land to the terrorists. You don't give away land, you do not divide land. But Unfortunately, the response was inadequate. You had American Jewish leadership was a disaster. Mm -hmm. So you had, I mean, how did that happen? And now, this is, what are we encountering now? That these 21 Jewish communities throughout Gaza, which were, this this was home to 8,000 Jews, the most spectacular Jewish communities in the southern region of Israel. If you've never seen it, you wouldn't believe what was going on there. Well, right now, where synagogues once stood, right now, where yeshivot, or places, houses of study, once stood, right now, where Israel was was growing 90% of its tomatoes and shipping it around the world, right now, these are launching pads for uh, uh, Hamas terrorists to shoot rockets at our civilian neighborhoods. Mm. Well, how did that happen? It's the same story. No one stood up. At every level, there was a disaster. Everyone was silent. Everyone was quiet. Everyone wanted to keep their job. Now, when I say everyone, it isn't everyone. There were great sages that condemned this, but there were too many good people that fell silent at a critical juncture in Jewish history. And that's what we're to take from the Book of Judges. The Torah, Tanakh, is not here to tell us nice things. Tanakh is not here to tell us the lullaby stories. Tanakh is there to guide us in how to live and, and guide our lives in the future. Now, you know, when you're driving, when you're driving, uh, you have a rear view mirror. It's, a, it's an important piece of safety equipment in your car. And... Sometimes, if you drove without a rear view mirror, you, you would, you, it would, you could very likely uh, get into an accident. But if you drive and you stare at the rear view mirror and nothing else, you'll crash. So what Tanakh is, is that mirror that we're able to look at the past, extrapolate from it, and then know how to guide our lives in the future. Mm-hmm. So... First of all, it's a, you, if, unless you're study, you're immersed in scripture, you're going to get yourself in a lot of trouble because Tanakh is not a, um, it's not a symmetrical text that just tells us everything like the newspaper, like uh, the, what happened today. So there's good news, there's bad news. Tanakh is not interested in good news because good news doesn't make you a better person. It's the mistakes of the past that help us make decisions for the future. And in fact, when you drive, when is the rear view mirror most important? When mm-hmm. you change lanes. Or that's when you really need that rear view mirror. Yeah. So that's what's happened. We can now look back, and we can look back 3,000 years to a horrific event mm-hmm. where Jewish leadership failed at, at, at every level. We had a general, but he was not a Torah scholar, mm-hmm. you know, who thought, and his daughter certainly wasn't. You know, his daughter certainly did not have the requisite knowledge of Jewish law 
to say, Dad, silly boy, that's not a vow. What would happen sure. if a pig came out of that? You'd slit off for a pig. So nobody, no one was there to guide this family. On every level, it was a disaster. And this tells us about what needs to happen when, in fact, there is a conflict. People need to step forward, put their pride aside, and also put aside their fear that they might lose their job. You know, and that's why what was horrific was after the destruction of Gush Katif, when the last Jew was expelled from Gaza on August 22nd, 2005, the same day that Katrina hovered over the Bahamas and came, uh, landed in, in, the, in, in, um, in the southern part of the United States. Uh, then Israeli leaders went and said, you know what, save the synagogues. There were 36 synagogues, save them from Hamas. Well, how stupid was that? Like, say the synagogue was brick and mortar? When it, where were you? You just wanted to keep your job? So mm -hmm. it was failure at every level, and that's what's coming into view here. You had a, a poor girl, she's the innocent one in all this. She technically is not sacrificed. She's sacrificed in that every hope and dream she ever had, which I'm sure was bound up in her dream of having a, a, a husband and, a ch and children was destroyed because everybody did the wrong thing at the wrong time. These were not, and these were pretty important people. You know, one of the things that's, just one of the things about Tanakh, because I'm really teaching how to understand, Tanakh does not waste its time with mediocre people. Yiftach was a very significant individual. The people alive at the time, the high priest, these are all important people, but they failed. They failed like 10 out of the 12 spies failed leadership failed, mm -hmm. and then disaster occurs. However, from the brink of despair, hope is born. Mm -hmm. Every great, every transition that occurred, uh, what made Jews come back to the land of Israel? It was trauma that was taking place in, in, in Russia, in Europe, and Jews came back to their land. What's making French Jews run to the land of Israel today? Well, there's some Zionism there, I'm sure, but it's also the terrorism and anti-Semitism on the streets of Paris. So what happens is in order for something great to happen, trauma in, invariably triggers it. Trauma allows for great transition. And that's why when we have a bris at a circumcision, we say that the Jewish people live by our blood. We, we in fact do. We in fact, when it is trauma that allows us to take, to take a step back, examine, and then succeed in our next step. Where, where can this, uh, this, information be be found is it in the is it in the talmud where they have the the information oh, you could, i mean you could just uh you know read, read the text itself and um i i wrote an article on this on facebook and those of you who i, I put it up on facebook it's also on our website uh outreachjudaism.org it's one of the articles up there so okay. you can go to the articles Perfect. and read about the event awesome. uh the, the key point is failure on every level Got this it. was object stupidity but there was object there was arrogance and it was the arrogance that allowed a tragedy to occur the purpose of this it, it, this is just a warning about particularly when we look at the book of joshua through second kings particularly the what's called the earlier prophets it's a little in a sense dangerous to read them and i don't mean dangerous i mean that in italics i just want to explain this these Sfarim, these books of the prophets, as I said, Joshua, Judges, 1st, 2nd Samuel, 1st, 2nd King, they read as narratives, they're gripping stories. And therefore, we can get caught up in the story and think that we're reading like a history book. Mm -hmm. And we, we don't get that this is all prophecy. Now, in contrast, what are called the latter prophets, namely Isaiah, uh, Ezekiel, these books are written in such an ecstatic, exotic, prophetic manner, they're not, they don't read like narratives, that it's impossible to ignore the fact that you're getting prophecy smashed over the head. You read Zechariah, it's, it's ecstatic with, with blinding colors of prophecy, but you can you can be seduced. And I, I warn those who, who love scripture, you can read Judges, you can read Joshua, you can read First Kings and be 
seduced into believing that you're reading Barbara Tuckman, that you're reading a history book, that you're reading a long story. People tend, I find this often, to read just one paragraph or one passage or two chapters and then skip somewhere else. So they don't get what's happening and what the picture, what the larger picture is, and they get themselves in a little bit of trouble. So you have to always ask, what is being conveyed here? What lesson is being conveyed here? Well, Perfect. it's obvious. Perfect. Thank you, Rabbi.